is a magical cylinder. We're dealing with contract law, interpretation of contract that's a very boring peric. It happens sometimes. There are parts of the Torah which on the surface can be boring. So how do we find matmonim in it? What do we discover? So from seeing how the Ritvo reads a technical piece of Gemara, it will open to us a whole poetic window into the universe. It's quite, it's quite amazing. As you know, the Ritvo is a favorite of mine among the Rishonim. He's one of the later Rishonim. So the Ritvo is in Spain in the 13th century, and he draws from everybody. That's part of what's amazing about the Ritvo. He's a synthesizer. So he's a Talmud of the Rashbo and the Ra'o, who are both Talmudim of the Ramban. So he gets that whole tradition. He's influenced by the Rif, who has come to Spain. And he, he's learned a lot of the, of the Rif's Torah. He's learned a lot of the Torah from the Tosfus. And he brings it all together. His mastery of Hebrew is phenomenal. And he writes his parish twice. That's probably the main reason why he's so accessible. He writes a full perush, and then he looks at it and he says, you know, the modern generation's attention span is not long enough to be able to work through the pieces that I've written. So he writes a shortened version where he condenses it and makes it easier to understand. And that's the version that we have of the Ritvo. So the way the Ritvo reads a very simple law that Ravdimi of Nahador, Ravdimi comes from the period of Abai and Rova. So this is the that rich period of the Talmud, Abai and Rova. You know how much we learn from Abai and Rova. Ravdimi is part of that school. It comes from Nahador. And he just tells us a simple law in laws of contract. And the Ritvo reads that, that law in a... Just by noticing a, a tiny detail, he opens something so beautiful. The Mishnah says at the beginning of the Perik, If you sell a house and all you say in the contract is the house and you give the address of the house, we interpret that very narrowly to mean the area for living in. A house is a place to live in. That doesn't include the roof. If the roof is a construction and it's used, that, that use is different. You can say, I didn't sell you the roof. I sold you the living area. It, it might not include the, the cellar. The, the reservoirs and, and, and pits underneath the house might not be included. The right to dig under the house. If you're living in Gaza, it could be that Hamas owns the rights to dig under your house, um, provided they don't shake the, uh, the structure of the house. So Rav Dimi says, If a man sells a house to his friend, even though you say, I'm not just sending, selling you the area, I'm selling you the height and the depth of the house. I'm selling you volume. In, in Israel, when you talk about the value of property, you often, often talk about square meters, right? How many square meters is it? But you're not just buying space, you're buying volume as well. Is it two floors? Is it three floors? How high are the ceilings? Even if you've written umkeveruba tsarich lemichtav le, that's not enough. You've got to also write. Even if you've written, I'm giving you depth and height and depth. Kani lach mitahom arav ad rum rakia. You've got to be more specific. From the depths of the earth till the heights of the heavens, you've got to sell to him. My timer, why? Normally, if you sell a house just beta, we see from the Mishnah, it doesn't include the roof, it doesn't include the cellar. So if you say umkeveruba, you're implying even the roof and even the cellar, the, the, the rights under the, under the house and the rights on top of the house. It doesn't, though, include elements of the structure that are not used for living in. So if you've got a cellar that is used to store the wine in, and you've got a place where the water is stored, that might not be included. That's not living area. That might not be included in the house. Even if you say, um kuvaruma. In order to include areas of the property that are used for things other than living in, you have to say from the depths of the earth till the heights of the sky. That's what Rav Zvi teaches us. So in the laws of contract, we interpret narrowly. If you say house, you mean the house. If you meant the, the roof as well, you would say the roof. If you say more than the house, then you've got a question. Why have you added these words? So then we say you probably mean a little bit more than the house. And so you'll see through the Peric in the various different case studies are how do we expand the intention of the contractor 
by virtue of additional words that he adds into the contract that he doesn't need. But even if he adds the word, says Rav Zvid, umka verumah, height and depth, that's not enough to give him these specific areas used for other things, unless he says from the depths of the earth to the heights of the heavens. Says the Ritvo, Piresh Morine, my Rebbe explained this Gemara. So the fact that he's already quoting his Rebbe, you know there's a Chidush coming. His Rebbe is the Ra'o. The Ra'o and the Rashbo were both Talmidim of the Ramban. Dafke Nakat Beta. Notice, says the Ra'o, that what does Rav Dimi Minahado say? Haim man de mazbin lei beta lechavre. This law of Rav Dimi applies for the sale of a house. And what about a field? If you sell a field, does it include the wells? Does it include any underground areas? Does it include mining rights? And under the field, you sell a field. That's a simple, good example. You sell a field and you say umkuvaruba. Does it include the mining? Or you don't say umkuvaruba, you just sell, the, you just sell the, the field. Does it include mining rights? Says the Ra'o, the Ritvo brings the Ra'o. This piece of Ravdimi that you've got to say from the depths of the earth to the heights of the heavens applies only if you're selling a house. If you're selling a field, you don't have to say that. If you sell a field, there is an implication that it includes up to the sky all the air rights and down to the depths, all the mining rights. Why? Because that's what a field means. A field doesn't just mean area. A field doesn't just mean 500 meters by 500 meters. A field has height and depth as well. It's so interesting. We think of a house as having height and depth, not only area, but a field we think of as area. No, says the Ra'o and the Ritvo, a field is not a two-dimensional plane. A field is a three-dimensional cylinder. It starts up at the top of the sky and it goes down into the depth of the earth. That's what a field is. So that requires, and we've got to think of this a little poetically. So when you look at a field, when you look at a garden, when you look at your yard, you've got to realize you're looking at a cylinder, you're not looking at a, at a flat plane. It gives you a different dimension of looking. What kind of a field would it be if it doesn't have access to rain and light and breeze, wind? You need that. So the air, the airspace is part of how the field works. A field is for agriculture. To grow something in a field, you don't just need the sand. You need the air above the field. That contributes to the growth. And the roots of your plants have to draw water from under the ground. And they need to draw minerals and nutrients from under the ground. So in order for that surface to be productive, the surface is to grow vegetables and fruit, trees on it. In order for that to happen, you need the air above and you need the earth and the nutrients below. That's what a field is. A field isn't just a flat piece of ground. It's redefinition of what a field is. Bishat HaGeshem, when it rains, Kidam Rinen Meseches Tainis. And he brings from the Gemara in Tainis, Gabi Tehom El Tehom Korei Lekol Tzinorecha. There's a posuk in Tehillim that the Gemara quotes that when we do the Nisu Chamaim on Sukkot, when we pour water onto the Beis Hamikdash and it goes down into the depths of the ground, and we also do Nisu Chayayim, we, we pour wine onto the Korbanot, David HaMelech says, Tehom El Tehom, depth calls to depth, and says, listen to the songs of the Levim as they're pouring the water. There's a conversation going on. Who's the conversation be he, between depth and depth? What's, what's the depth and depth? Explains the Marsha on the next page. The wine pouring that we always have and the water pouring that's added on Sukkot. 
the reason that we pour the Nisu Chamayim, we pour water onto the Mizbeach, onto the altar during Sukkot, is to give brocha to the rainy season. That's why we say Tfilat Geshem on Sukkot, on Shmini Atzeret. Kamrin and Peri Kamad Rosh Hashanah, Vahainu Beit Reim Bechag. And these are the two friends on Sukkot, the, the, the wine and the water. Vahamar Kol Al Shem Shivat Nisuchim, and it uses in the word in, in Tehillim uses the word voice because the Levim sing with their voices while this pouring is happening. Happening a mighty lation emar to home el to home kore le kolt sinorecha. One depth calls to the other depth to listen to the sounds of music played while the pipes are being are being filled with water. Tahinu to home ilaa. Utahom tata. There's a there's a depth upwards and there's a depth downwards. The depth upwards is the water vapor and the clouds that are going to bring rain from, from the sky. And the tahom tata is the water underground that is going to bring water from the ground up to the earth. So the earth, the farmland, is the point of interface between water from above and water from below. And where those waters meet is where the produce grows. That's where we get all our food from, where the upper waters and the lower waters meet. And, and so on. So ends the ritvo. That's why it says, if you sell a house, all you're selling is the house. So you've got to define how much house are you selling. But if you're selling a field, you're selling it all the way to the sky and all the way down to the depths because a field needs height, and a field needs depth, and you see that from the Posuk in Tehillim that the Gomorrah in Tainis quotes. So that's just a beautiful way. That means when you're walking around, when you walk in the streets of Ranana or Yerushalayim or Tel Aviv or anywhere else for that matter, to feel you're walking in a cylinder. You're not walking on a flat plane. You're embraced by a cylinder that contains, that goes all the way down and all the way up. And particularly in, in Eretz Israel, to understand what the meaning of that cylinder is. And the meaning of that cylinder goes much further if we connect this piece of Gomorrah to the Medrash here on Shabbos. What do we learn in the Medrash here on Shabbos? That Shehakol that you say on water, the bracha that you say on water, is not a birkat hanenim. It's not a bracha for the benefit and pleasure we get from eating it. Make a bracha, bore priya etz, you're making a bracha for the pleasure of eating the apple. A bore priya gofen, you make a bracha for the pleasure of drinking the wine. If you make it on an ice cream, you're making it for the pleasure of eating the ice cream. But the shakol bidvaro on water is a different brocha. The shakol bidvaro on water, really, water shouldn't need a brocha. It doesn't have taste and it doesn't have nutrients. So you shouldn't need to make a brocha on water. The reason we make a brocha on water, we learned on Shabbos, is because shakol bidvaro celebrates and praises God for nisim, for miracles. That's our chance to make a brocha for nisim. In Eretz Yisrael, a nace occurred yesterday. Now we say, lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael. The guardian of Israel doesn't sleep. What that means is, when you're asleep, he's not. You wake up in the morning and you didn't even know that thousands of rockets were scheduled to hit us at five o'clock. You didn't even know that you're sleeping. But the Rebbe is not sleeping. He's awake. And he's helping, and he's helping the army. And we think oh, the army, good technology, good time, and Great Sal did well. Yes, Great Sal did amazingly well. But what is a miracle? A nace, I've always described a nace is when the odds are low and the stakes are high. The odds of getting every single one of those missiles, those odds are low. One or two will get fired. And Varaya, the proof is they declared a state of emergency. Why did they declare a state of emergency if it was clear that they were going to get them out? They weren't so sure they would get them out. That they got everyone out and we woke up in the morning and it was all past already. It was all over. That was nice. That was miracle. So where do we say a bracha? We don't say I go email for that. When do we say a bracha? You take a glass of water and you say, Shehakol niye bidvaro. Nothing happens in this world without Hashem's word. That's when you say the bracha for what happened, what happened yesterday. And, and every day of our lives. And the idea of water we learnt on Shabbos is that water represents miracle because miracle is when nature and man have a reciprocal relationship. When nature responds to human behavior, that's nice. That's miracle. 
That's what nice is. We daven and, and, and something else. We talked about in the Adam Ayin La Vodeta Adaman. We learned the Rashi and Breshis that since there was no human being to appreciate rain and daven for rain, rain didn't come. Rain comes. Water comes as a consequence of our appreciation. Miracles happen as a consequence of our appreciation, not the other way around. It's not first as a miracle, then we appreciate. No, if we appreciate, then miracles happen. That, that's what a miracle is. And water is the prime example of miracle. We daven, water comes. We behave, water comes. Tishmu, second paragraph of the Shema. We do certain things, water comes. Where does the water come from? The top and the bottom. The top is the real miraculous water. The bottom is the natural water that comes from the world, that comes from nature, that is, is much more natural. So the way the Ritvo and the Ra'or learn Ravdimi, that we're talking specifically about a house because a house is an artificial structure. A house is built by a human being. A house is technology. If you're dealing with technology and artificiality, you define it the way man defines it. But if you're dealing with nature, you're dealing with a field, now you're operating, if you're walking through a field or you're walking down the street, you're walking at the point of interface between upper miracle and lower miracle, which when they combine, produces food that nourishes the world. What an unbelievable idea as, as you walk around the world. We walk with our eyes closed, we walk with our hearts closed. But here's an example of how the Ritvo understands the Gomorrah as part of life. The Ritvo understands the Gomorrah as, as part of the universe, as part of the laws and the way the world operates. It's not just laws of contract we're learning. By understanding the laws of contract and noticing that Rav Dimi's statement applies specifically to an artificial structure like a house and not to a natural part of nature such as a field, we understand the difference between a house where you're only selling what's contained in the house and a field which is not a two-dimensional plane but is actually a magical three-dimensional cylinder in which we find ourselves as we walk outside in nature.